Hello, welcome to the screencast of using low-cost environmental sensors in geoscience education. This is an online version of a talk that I gave at the American Geophysical Union meeting in December of 2014. Sensors are all around us, and they're becoming more and more prevalent in our smartphones, tablets, watches, and all kinds of electronics. This has presented a really unique opportunity to us as geoscience educators and as researchers to further our understanding and how we share our science. So as I said, these sensors are in everything and they're becoming so small and fast and low power. It's just absolutely incredible. Thanks to some advances in process technology such as MIMS and a really large demand for sensors to fill the consumer electronics market, their price has fallen and fallen until you can get a magnetometer for about $3. And that's a full three axis magnetometer. There's a sampling of sensors here, but there's all kinds of specialty sensors as well. Meteorology packages, ground motion, radiation, you name it, there's a sensor out there already made for it. Along with sensors, microcomputers have evolved, and actually full-on computers even have evolved, to become smaller and cheaper. You can take a microcontroller, such as an Arduino, or a parallax propeller, or an MSP430, which are very low power, have small amounts of memory, but can still do all these sensor tasks and implement it into your project for well under $20. If you need more power, you can get a complete Linux box with something like the BeagleBone Black or the Raspberry Pi. Those are about the size of a credit card and still around $50. If you need even more power, you can go with an FPGA. An FPGA is basically a chip that you can completely design. So you're not only designing software, you're actually designing the hardware. And FPGA development boards have come down quite a bit. In fact, you can get some for as low as $100 now. So makers and educators and even scientists have been doing some really incredible things with all this open hardware. The Raspberry Pi in the Sky project took the Raspberry Pi to the edge of space on balloons several times. And Zach Manchester, actually sent an entire fleet of MSP430s into space with the Kicksat project. And these were only powered by the solar cell. There's no battery or anything like that. They're very small, low-power chips. But with all these sensors and microcomputers, we have to do something with the data. This is where the Internet of Things comes in. The Internet of Things is the idea that any embedded system can send data up to the Internet, up to some repository that's generally publicly accessible, and queryable, and we, we can put all this data together and see what we can learn from it. One of the prime examples of this is the Weather Underground Personal Weather Station Network. Weather Underground has over 37,000 contributors, people just like you and me that are enthusiasts or interested in the weather, have weather stations, what have you, and they just share that data. And it's really easy to do. Weather Underground even sells complete packages that just connect to your Wi-Fi and you're all set. There are other efforts, such as the URAD monitor, that are just now getting uh, started. The URAD monitor has close to 450 subscribers in the works now, and its goal is to produce a global radiation monitoring network. It's completely open source. All it takes is power and an Ethernet connection. So to show how easy it is to get something online, we put a three-axis magnetometer online. The magnetometer is a little red board up here, and the sensor on that board costs about $3 and hooks up to an Arduino Yoon. The Arduino has a microcontroller, a very small Linux-based computer, and Wi-Fi all built on that one little board, and the sensor just connects up to it. We read in, do a little bit of averaging, and send about two readings a minute out to data.sparkfun.com, which is a host. And we've been doing that for over two months now, so we have a pretty decent data set to look at. Just looking at the sensitivity and noise figures, you say, well, they're not very impressive. But this is a really good opportunity to, like I said, use averaging or teach students signal processing. Also teach them how to work with non-ideal data sets. And if you involve the students in collecting this data, if they can actually hook up the sensor to the UN and plug the UN in, upload the program that's going to do the data collection, they become attached to this data, and they're more likely to go digging through it and exploring. Getting to the data couldn't be easier. It's on an open source FANT server, 
So all you do is go to data.sparkfun.com and then the stream address, and this page will come up. You can watch data come in real time, or you can just download it in any format that you really want. If we look at 10 days worth of data, you can see our sensor in black mirrors the large scale features, at least, of the USGS station, which is in red and is orders of magnitude more expensive. Now, these are not co located, but they're relatively close, and we can see that we see the diurnal field variation, and students could go through this and look for things like solar storms over really long data sets. Now, you can also calculate things like magnetic heading, magnetic inclination. Uh, you can do Fourier analysis, teach filtering, all of that on this simple data set. Heading here, shown over the same 10 days, varies by you know a couple tenths of a degree. It's really not much for a sensor that's this cheap. And this sensor has not been rigorously calibrated. You can go through calibration routines that are like those that are used in your smartphone and get this much better. Now, data analysis can be done in Python notebooks. These are completely open source tools that run in the browser, which means that they'll run on Linux, on Windows, on Mac, and they'll look the same on all platforms. And these let you put code and text and equations, video, images, just about anything you can imagine, all in one place. So the idea is to have this cohesive notebook and to really make things open. You can see, okay, I'm reading the data in, and I'm doing this processing to it, and here's the plot that results. Students can share notebooks and maybe change a little bit in the processing or change the filter and immediately see how that affects what they're looking at. We've also developed this little, I call it a 3D compass, that shows the Earth's magnetic vector in pseudo three dimensions. It has these two rings of lights, and the intensity shows the vector direction. And so you can rotate this around, watch the lights move, and you can plug it into the USB port of your computer and pull the data right off. This is entirely open source. You can go on GitHub and download the electronics instructions, the code that runs on the Arduino, and even the files for the 3D printed parts that are required to build your own. So the message here is to go make something. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be electronic, it could be not electronic. It could be really complicated or it could be as simple as a column of staples demonstrating geometric cohesion, as you see in the bottom right there. The idea is make something, share it with your students, share it with people that come through your lab, people in daily life, and then most importantly, share it with each other. Once you create something, don't say, well, that's good enough, and put it on the shelf. Write up some instructions, put it on your blog, put it online somewhere, put it on Thingiverse, GitHub, anywhere. Just make sure that everybody can access it, and then it'll be improved by the community. That's one of the wonderful things about how open source works. All the content from this presentation, this video, data, links, all of that's on my website and on the session blog. And I've got links to all of that down below the YouTube video here. Thank you.